All right. So what was your reaction for the first time that you landed in Pakistan? Oh, that's a, a hard question because on the way here we knew that we were facing a major natural disaster. So none of the first impressions counted, you know, that you're in Pakistan, that you're in a new country, that there are people wearing shawal kameers and things like that. None of that did. When we first arrived, the, the focus was get our team set up, find who in the government we're supposed to be working with, and then let's start coordinating the relief. Let's start getting things in. 8th October, 2005. For those who live to tell the tale, the memories are indelible. Nearly 75,000 people lost their lives in the earthquake that struck northern Pakistan. Many more were injured. Millions became homeless. Amidst the despair, humanity's finest hour, as Pakistanis and others from around the globe rush to help. Particularly in that early days, it's about coordinating the urban search and rescue teams because you only have really five or six realistic days to save people underneath rubble. So the most important thing was getting those structures set up. Okay. In Islamabad, the chief operating officer of the UN's emergency center, Andrew McLeod, repeated the plea. The humanitarian community here is underfunded by hundreds of millions of dollars. To be frank, I just don't think the world gets it. We have one of the best organized relief operations going here, and we are not just not getting the funding. If the second wave of deaths hit, it's the major donors that are going to have to look at themselves in the mirrors and ask why. There are more than 15,000 villages and towns in the affected region, and many of them are going to be cut off from around about the 1st of December because of the decreasing snow line. We, we have such a short time to be able to give assistance to the most vulnerable people. We had 3.5 million people homeless. We had a Himalayan winter only 30 or 40 days away. So the main challenge in simple was keep the people alive until the following March. We needed to keep them alive. More than 5,000 sorties were flown by American and Pakistan army pilots to deliver 15,000 tons of relief supplies to the stricken areas. The biggest helicopter airlift in history. What were the things that were difficult to address with in the beginning? Like the communication or the acceptance or the weather, what was it? Well, none of that really. I mean, October the weather was fine. Um, and you've got to understand, I'm part of a, an organisation called UNDAC, the United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination Team. We are trained to come into an environment not being sure of our communications, not being sure of our office space, not being sure where we're living. In fact, we come with 72 hours self-sustainability. We bring our own food, we bring tents and all of that sort of stuff. So those things don't impact on us. We're trained for that. But I think the thing that impacts you the most when you come for a new disaster is the massive increase in your working hours each day. You know, you're working from 6 a.m. in the morning until 2 a.m. in the morning, grabbing two or three hours sleep and then you're working again. So you're on an adrenaline-based, results-focused, let's just get the job done. Um, and that's the only thing you're thinking about. Nothing else impacts on you for, for quite some time. Our will was there, but the biggest thing that we had was the experience. The entire international community, which was American as well, the experience over the other disasters, they have told us that this can be done in this way. And I think that value addition is very good with that value addition. Now, I'm going to introduce you to someone very important because, as I've said to a lot of people, this is the best example of civil and military cooperation in any country, anywhere, ever, full stop. So I'm going to introduce you to Major General Nadeem Ahmed, who is the Vice Chief of General Staff and the guy who's made this whole operation work. That was very kind of Andrew, actually. He is the guy who pushed me doing all these things. So if there's any credit to Pakistan and Pakistan military, it's because of this white guy from Australia. That's I also true, like him yeah. because whenever there's a cricket match, he's on our side. Absolutely. <laughs> Just a minute here. Chai aap peete re? I don't have a problem with it. As uh, all of you know that uh, today, we are, I think, bidding farewell to Andrew. Uh, actually, a uh, lot of people may be knowing him, a lot of people may not be knowing when he arrived, what he did, and what he did not. Uh, 
Andrew was with us, I think, right from almost like day two. And uh, I have had the privilege of knowing him ever since. So we have worked through the relief days and worked very closely. And um, those days were really very, very difficult and very, very trying for all of us uh, to see the kind of, uh, you know, devastation, the damages, and it was not respected to building the loan, to people, and uh, launching such a huge relief operation uh, in uh, close collaboration with a lot of international partners, uh, which came from all over the world, as far as Cuba. And uh, then be able to create a synergy was a challenge in itself. And I remember that when we started uh, the Federal Relief Commission, uh, we hardly knew what uh, road or what path we have to take, uh, what uh, is going to be the organizational structure, what we need to do. And uh, I think whatever we did finally manage, uh, there was a lot of contribution uh, from Andrew, who was then representing UN uh, Office on Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs commonly known as OCHA. And actually, um, if you look at the entire UN system and the cluster approach that was <coughs> being run by, and some of the very critical decisions uh, with regard to organizational uh, structure of FRC, with uh, regard to creation of uh, strategic leaders forum, with regard to coming up with a, uh, what was that plan? Uh, he was like a partner throughout, he worked very closely with us. Uh, there were a lot of issues which would crop up on ground and I would just tell him, just hop on the chopper and let's go sort it out. And not once, not twice, many times he went, <coughs> coordinated the meeting, sorted out the issues right on ground. We managed to, I think, uh, go as far as scale uh, to sort out an issue where uh, the Pakistan army people were accused that they have abducted the UN helicopter uh, by force and uh, to places like Lipa where uh, not many people went because the helicopter was just landing uh, next to the line of control and, and uh, he actually uh, at a personal level taught me many things how to interact with the international organizations and NGOs and when to say no, when to say yes and if, if you want to get something, how, how do you really get those things done in the way you want. Then, Though we had formulated a coordinating mechanism here at the, at the federal level, that coordinating mechanism was sadly lacking in the field. And it was right in the beginning, I think, maybe third or fourth week, that flew in to Bagh and Muzaffarabad and Mansera, got all the army people, the government people, the INGOs, the NGOs, and created a coordinating mechanism at the field level, again to create synergy. So if Today, everybody stands in the world and says that Pakistan's relief operation was a great success. I think a lot of credit goes uh, for very valuable input and contribution to him. Uh, it's been really a privilege and a pleasure for me personally and for all those who know him right from day one working with him. So he has at times, you know, roughed out with some of the people, but mostly those were international. And actually, uh, he was, uh, I think, one of the strongest uh, and uh, vocal supporters of uh, FRC of those days uh, with the FRC in those international meetings where probably uh, at times FRC was criticized. <coughs> then came uh, the second uh, phase when we started to check that we need to now come out with an exit strategy and therefore, and we realized at that time that you know, from relief you can't simply move on to reconstruction. And we then came up, UN had worked out uh, uh, early recovery plan. And it, I think it was because of his effort that we were able to coin it as an era UN early recovery plan. Because we looked at the, those plans and really um, uh, screwed, down, screwed them down to the last uh, bolt to ensure that these programs of early recovery plan. So we looked at that and I think Andrew and TRC and with the input of program managers, we were able to come up with a very good document, uh, which is uh, now I think uh, in different conferences projected as a as a very 
foot, call it base for an early recovery operation. <coughs> we didn't stop there. I think again, if you look at uh, the complete spectrum of disaster management, Pakistan may well be the only country which has gone through from relief to early recovery to recovery and simultaneously starting with the reconstruction and rehab operations. And then we went to this third stage of uh, an era recovery plan, in which again, this was the time when we shifted the responsibility to the program managers and DG uh, P2. And I'm happy that we have again have a proper early recovery plan, which is up till June 2008. Uh, throughout, I think, uh, whenever we had any problem uh, with any of the internationals, uh, we always solicited his advice, which was always, uh, I think, uh, very well informed. At many times, uh, in my own frustration, and maybe when I was tired, uh, I, he came up and said, we need to do this. I said, forget it. I'm not doing it. And I must admire his patience, though he's not a patient man by nature, <laughs> uh, that he would say, sir, I would still recommend, please do this. And I would say, no, I'm not going. And he would say, sir, please. And I remember one time when we were doing relief operations, uh, we were starting and we got these huge MI-26 helicopters. And uh, we were not finding places there to locate these helicopters. And we had a conference in GHQ in which he was also there. And those days I was a very strong, I am still a strong environmentalist. And these chaps came from UNHAS, United Nations Helicopter Air Services, and said, Abbottabad, if you look at the Abbottabad Center, they have a huge golf course and they wanted to put their helicopter there. And they said, we would just cut these two trees. I said, no way. And uh, they said, uh, without this, we cannot land an MI-23. It's such a huge damn thing. It's, it carries about 126 passengers. It would carry a dozer like, uh, like a pin. And uh, they said, still, sir, we would need to cut it. And they thought that they will be able to put, push their way through. And I said, no way. They said, we will not be able to place these helicopters. I said, I don't care. Don't put these helicopters there. I don't need it. But those trees will not be cut. And uh, I think, again, uh, there were certain other issues on which he came up that this is how you will you should handle the international organization. And we got the helicopters. We let the trees stay. We came around the problem because of the sound advice. Uh, so uh, and I think. It has been almost uh, that uh, it's two and a half years that he has been here. I'm sure he's, uh, his heart is more than half Pakistani. And uh, he's been a great ambassador of Pakistan in different international conferences. He's written very extensively on his experiences of Pakistan in a very positive light. And, it, it's, and I get the credit at times because I see some at some of the places in the, what is it called? Was the Nietzsche notes of there? Footnotes, may you know, an art. They quote Nadeem and Andrew for you know, writing something which actually he wrote. I never wrote anything except, except giving him my you know, thoughts on it. Uh, I think his uh, fate is still not decided where he is going to go from here. Uh, but uh, we all wish you uh, good luck. Uh, we all value your uh, partnership and friendship, uh, your valuable advice, all critical times. You are being with us in this uh, very difficult and tiring time when the whole country experienced a disaster of which we could never conceive. Um, and I hope these memories and this association that we have developed uh, over these two and a half years uh, will stay for uh, at least our lives. And uh, this is, uh, we value it a great deal. Uh, and at the end, I just wish that uh, you come back to Pakistan on on any other appointment, and I also wish that you get married as early as possible. <laughs> <laughs>
He's running around with his walkie-talkie. He's got his cell phone talking to people, people calling, Geneva's calling him, how does he respond? He's got these clusters, what's a cluster? How do we deal with all these different issues? And then you should see him today, walking down the different halls, senior advisor this, senior advisor that. What happens to us emergency people? <laughs> I must say, Andrew, it has been an absolute pleasure to, uh, to work with you, mate. Um, I don't know what I like more, agreeing with you or disagreeing with you, because both, both, uh, <laughs> both result in enjoyable conversations. Um, we've hung out on the mountain, we've been together in the coordination meetings, looked at One UN, Love. looked at saving lives. And uh, it'll be kind of nice to meet you in the next place when we don't have these on and we've got our t-shirts getting our hands dirty again. This is an example of a year three emergency responder who stayed in the same place. Best luck in the next place for you. See ya. You want me to say something about yeah. Andrew? Andrew McCloy. Mm -hmm. We uh, know him uh, as a person with a particular hat and uh, he would be visiting uh, Muzaffarabad, usually uh, troubleshooting on behalf of the RC or more. In fact, he was on behalf of the TRC or more on behalf of General Nadeem. He would be there. What uh, uh, I rated him, rated something different in him than the others was his passion about the issues that he addressed and the way he addressed. He was heard mm -hmm. and people in uh, government of AJK valued his uh, opinion and whatever he highlighted, people actually went and did that. He, uh, you can say that uh, um, I was told last time when he was in uh, AJK, he met the chief secretary and he was highlighting an issue. An issue was, this is perhaps last July, an issue he was highlighting was prepare for the winters the winters to come and now is the time for you to be working. That is the point that he was highlighting. The way he uh, highlighted that with the Chief Secretary, Chief Secretary followed it, followed it up with a meeting of all stakeholders and I was approached by the staff of the Chief Secretary here in Islamabad. Mm -hmm. I was there, I was here in Islamabad that day and they, and they said, message from the Chief Secretary that Dr. Andrew mm -hmm. must attend. So they thought he's a PhD. <laughs> I mean, that is, <laughs> and not only that, uh, this, is, this is not the first instance, in fact, uh, everybody was so impressed about him, not only of this particular issue, this is this winter I'm talking of, I'm talking of last winter. Okay. <laughs> last winter also, last winter uh, he led the winterization campaign, that although we got a very little time to do that, mm -hmm. and the way he persuaded everybody, we ended up giving winterized kits and tentage to more than 5,000 people, 5,000 families in uh, Muzaffarabad and AJK. And this is what I would say rate him the highest. His, uh, <clears throat> one, something about Pakistan, and the, uh, one thing in one area which I think he is very good and he's more like us and that is at times he could say something and start thinking about it later also. <laughs> He's Australian, and it's so obvious he's Australian. I lived in Australia for a while. He's Australian. He talks a lot, has incredibly strong opinions on so many topics. It must have been like, I don't know, his ancestors, since they're all ex-convicts anyways in Australia. Mm -hmm. I think he carries some of those genes. But apart from some of those negative things, which uh, I will always remember, that I will never forget. Yes, sorry, Andrew, I will not forget them. I must admit that his energy and his dedication to the UN, to the people affected by the earthquake here, is absolutely commendable. And it's people like him that drive change. And we need more change. And we need more change in the UN. So Andrew, best of luck with everything. And I look forward to seeing you in some other incarnation in future. Best and of luck. And what about your uh, views on what he said today? What he said today, yes, on this debate in the UN, I don't know. Sometimes he speaks nonsense, other times he speaks with more sense than anybody else. 
So I'll have to think about that a little bit more before I tell you my conclusion on how I feel about and it. And can I meet you again for that? Can you meet me again? Yeah, you can meet me again for that. Okay. No problem. Thank you so much. Okay. Excel, bro. Can everyone hear me without a microphone? <laughs> I don't like microphones. No, then for you. Exactly. <laughs> In 1966, the year of my birth, Robert Kennedy, the younger brother of John F. Kennedy, gave a speech. You prefer me to use a microphone, do you? Yes. Okay, I'm quite happy to use a microphone. Allow me, allow me to read to you an extract from his speech. And he said this, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sets forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centres of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Yet, few are willing to brave the disapproval of their fellows, the censure of their colleagues and the wrath of their society. Moral courage is a rarer commodity than bravery in battle or intelligence. Yet it is the one essential vital quality for those who seek to change a world that yields most painfully to change. I carry this piece of paper around with me each day, but it's a strange quote for someone who's about to oppose reform. Well, I'm opposing it because I'm about to tell you the emperor is wearing no clothes. I don't oppose reform per se, I oppose this reform. And I oppose this reform because it's not making any significant change. It's wasting our time. It's wasting our effort. It's wasting our resources. And it's giving us a curtain to hide behind so we don't undertake the real change that the United Nations needs. We don't undertake the moral courage to say, let's reform our human resources system. Let's hire and fire according to merit and no other criteria. Let's have one leader in the UN. And let me, I don't care if it's a man or a woman, but let's have a leader. Let's have someone in charge and responsible. And this UN reform is doing nothing about that. It's talking about little process. It's setting very moderate objectives and not even meeting those. It's wasting our time. Let me give you three examples. Let me call one symbolic, one programmatic, and one pragmatic. On the symbolic side, when this reform was first created, it was called one UN reform. And then we sat around and said, oh, no, we can't say that. We can't let people think we're one UN. So we came up with delivering as one because we are too scared to say one UN. What's the symbolism in that? Right from the very beginning, we killed it. And then another piece of symbolism. The US ambassador has a flag on his cup. But the head of USAID does not. The British ambassador has a flag on his cup. Not hers, his but the head of DFID does not. Yet the resident coordinator probably rightfully has a flag in his car, but so does the head of WFP, the head of UNICEF. Even a P5 head of a joint program, UNAIDS until recently had a flag in his car, and it's not even an agency. If we can't agree to have one leader, one flag, one symbol, if we can't agree on a unified symbolism, how can we agree on a unified substance? And here is an objective measure for you about whether this is successful. Will our heads of agencies remove the flags from their cars? And I demand that they do. And I start the demand with Alvaro. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new UNDP head, he hasn't, and let's hope it continues that way. So that's the symbolism. So let's now talk about the programmatic. When we talked about the one UN reform, General Nadine, who was the Deputy Chairman of ERRA, said, what on earth are you talking about? They've already done it. As far as the government of Pakistan was concerned, the relief effort following the earthquake was delivering as one. In fact, these delivering one re UN reforms are not a step forward to what we can achieve, they're a step backwards to what we've already done. And let's talk about pragmatic. Delivering as one is not something we reform into. In any other industry in the world, delivering as one is the essential precondition of survival. How much Pepsi would the street seller sell if he decides to put it in a different container? Or not put up the advertising? Does Pepsi own the shop in Colesar Market? No. But there is a clear delivery from production all the way through. A delivery as one. What about McDonald's and Rollpin? Is it owned by the United States? No. 
And what if the guy who owned McDonald's and Ralphie decided, I'm not going to sell a Big Mac, I'm going to make my own hamburger? That's the end of the day. Delivering as one in any other industry is a precondition of survival. It's not something we must reform into. It's something we must do from the start and then look to a real reform. So I'm against this one UN reform because it fails to make us take the tough decisions. It does not engage our moral courage. It does not engage our strength of character. It does not force us to risk the sanction of our colleagues. It's a curtain behind which we're hiding. So yet again we fail. Yet again we fail to answer the questions in real time after real time evaluation about having one leader, someone in charge, agencies reporting to the resident coordinator, hiring and firing according to merit. That's what we should be reforming. That's what we should be changing. This is not doing it and it's just wasting our time. The Emperor has no clothes. It's difficult to summarise two years, four months and 29 days, which is how done following the earthquake and I was told you will be going for one week, maximum two. And this is the longest two weeks of my life. <laughs> and it's probably the best two weeks of my life as well. I'm not going to dwell too much on, on the earthquake, other than to say we have together as a team passed through some of the most incredible challenges. You know, when we look back on October 2005, when we look at those raw statistics of 140,000 people injured or seriously injured, 70,000 people dead, 3.5 million people made homeless, a brutal Himalayan winter six weeks away. Now this created a humanitarian burden twice as large as all of the tsunami countries combined. And the tsunami was dealt with by three governments, principally Indonesia, Thailand and Sri Lanka. And if you're in the tsunami and you didn't get a house and you had to sleep under a palm tree for a year, well, bad luck. But if you didn't get sheltered within six weeks in the high areas of the earthquake affected zone, you would freeze to death and you would die. And we were expecting many thousands of deaths, but that first challenge of actually getting the relief efforts set up and running and working. And I remember sitting with General Nadim in late November 2005 on a Sunday and we were having a cup of tea. And we just looked at each other and at the spur it was like, we think this is going to work. Now up until then, you know, it was so stressful, go, 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 do things, get things out there and build these coordination structures and mechanisms and in November 2005 for the first time we felt it's going to work and it did and the challenge then of transitioning into early recovery which has never been done in general's right, nowhere else has there been a transition to early recovery and why is that important? What normally happens after a natural disaster is there's a decrease in service delivery to the population because of the disaster and then when the relief workers go it decreases even further and a natural disaster normally causes a huge developmental back step for the people but what did we see here we saw immediately after the earthquake largely because of two and a half thousand cuban doctors and 65 field hospitals an increase in service delivery and health and then by effective management the trc running the early recovery plan with the program managers we've seen a consistent is not a disaster that set the people of Kashmir and NWFP backwards. It's been an opportunity which has really been using to move people forward. So, <laughs> sir, it's a challenge for yourself and your counterpart in Peshawar mm -hmm. to ensure that these gains are, are cemented, that we budget properly for operations and management costs and staffing costs. And if we succeed in this and we can say to the rest of the world, if you do it right, you take an, a disaster like the earthquake and it will move your people forward. And I'm often disappointed by the floods response in Baluchistan. Not because of problems with engagement or coordination or whatever, but I always ask myself, if we were able to do for the people in Baluchistan what we did for the people in Kashmir and NWFP, what a different country Pakistan would be. Imagine if we were also seeing those developmental increases in Baluchistan. As a fairly senior person within the government of Pakistan, I won't say who it is that said to me, Andrew, don't worry about Baluchistan. The people down there eat tree bark. They used to eat tree bark. They will eat tree bark and they will continue to eat tree bark. And it was such a lack of respect for the people, which is why we're not seeing <coughs> gains in Baluchistan. And the strongest thing that I get out of my work in FRC and with ERAD, particularly with the general, is the main driving force is the concern for the people. 
we're actually wanting to make life better. And in Australia, one of the things that's fairly common is we have these, like in America they call them trucks, we call them utility cars, you know, open tray back cars. And, you know, farmers would drive with their dogs in the back and the dogs would have their tongues hanging out in the, in the wind, sort of blowing very happily sitting in the back of, a, back of a truck. And I remember one day flying with General Nadine and we had the windows open in the MIA and we were sort of putting our heads out every now and again and our tongues were sort of blowing out like the, the dogs in the back of the ute. And I looked at the General and I remembered October 2005 flying over and seeing devastation and November starting to see tents and December and January starting to see emergency shelters. And now when we fly over, we see roads, and we see bridges, and we see schools, and we see hospitals. And I looked at the general and I said, Sir, I know why you don't want to be a Corps Commander. <laughs> this is too good a job. And he's like, yeah. But we've all been part of that. There is one challenge more. There is a tough challenge, and that is closing <coughs> error. Now, we are a transitional organisation and we need, and I say we because I feel part of error more than anything else. A time must come when we close. Our objective now must be to close effectively. Keep the momentum going, effectively hand over to the provincial line ministries and the federal line ministries where relevant. Make sure the work keeps going. But resist temptation for error to become another bureaucratic organisation. Keep the momentum, keep the flexibility, keep the change going and keep the focus in supporting the people. Because this will then be the model that I can keep saying to the world, that's, that's how you do it. You want to see how to do it? Go to Pakistan. But let me conclude on a personal note because I didn't come here and, and get work colleagues. I came here and have got many friends and in many ways family. I have a new big brother. Um, people that I rely on and consult with very strongly about many personal issues as well as professional. And if there is ever an incentive for me to get married, it's so I can bring this man to Australia <laughs> to a wedding. <laughs> but when I look around the room, there are people I've been working with now for two, two and a half years. Yourself, Brigadier Warach, Major Janaid, everybody else who is here, Brigadier Waka, of course, General Nadine. And I will leave with sorrow. I will leave with happiness. I'll leave with happiness of an incredible job done, an incredible team that we have together. And the fact that um, even to a fault, no one considers me a foreigner. I remember one time when General Nadine said to me, look, Andrew, just tell General Shaquille to do this, this, and this. And I had to draw a line. I said, actually, sir, I feel really uncomfortable doing that. He was like, why? I said, well, you can't use an Australian to pass an order from one general to another general. He was like, why? You're Andrew. And I remember Brigadier Warach and I went to the training college in um, Abbottabad once. And Brigadier Warach said, oh, look, I want to show you around. And we pulled up to a gate. And this poor corporal comes out and he says, but, but sir, you you can't bring in a foreigner. And Brigadier Warach is like, what foreigner? And the Brigadier Warach is him. Oh, sorry, the corporal is him. He's like, he's not a foreigner. That's Mr. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this poor corporal sitting there. And this Brigadier saying, no, you've got to let him in. So I'm going to take away fond memories, friends. I will come back many times, I hope. I really want to ride a motorcycle from Islamabad to Beijing one day, right up the KKH. That would be fantastic. I really want to see what Bakriyal looks like in five or ten years. I want to see what Musafrabad looks like in five or ten years. I really want to see that we've moved it forward. And the last thing I want to say to you is, whatever skills and knowledge you've learned in this work, make sure it gets passed to other people in Pakistan, other line departments. If a crisis like Baluchistan happened again, don't let the government fail it again. You have the responsibility, you have the knowledge, you have the capacity to be able to really move the whole country forward and use it in whichever ways you can as you move forward. And thank you for your friendship, thank you for your partnership, but more importantly, thank you for the great work you've done for the people of NWFP and AJK. Thank you. <laughs> that I'm going to take away from, from here more strongly than anything else is how fantastic the Pakistani people have been. Most of the work in the relief effort and most of the work in the reconstruction is done by the people themselves. The inherent ability of the Pakistanis to put their feet down, stand up and say, right, now we're going to move on. I mean, this is incredible. The memory that I'm going to take away from, from here more strongly than anything else is how fantastic the Pakistani people have been.